and welcome to our webinar, Building Stronger Engineering Teams with Team Timologies, uh, Lessons from Docker's Journey. Today, we're featuring JLD Mohan, who's the VP of Software Engineering at Docker. I'm Jared, Content Manager at Unleash, and I'll be your host, and you're not going to see a lot of me today. Um, but before we get started, some quick housekeeping. We have people joining on a bunch of different platforms, including LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, so from whatever platform you're tuning in from, uh, let's see if this uh, works. So just type in the comment field. Uh, if, if, you have, if you have any sort of comment or question, type it in the comment field. Let's try it out. Uh, let's practice. What country are you tuning in from? Type that in now. And just make sure this works. And we also just like to see uh, where you guys are coming in from. Nice. We have some people uh, writing answers already. And, and guys, you're not going to see a lot of my face today. Today is about JL. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about team topologies, and we're going to follow Docker's journey through experimenting with culture and organizational structures. And guys, I'm kind of geeking out because my background's a little bit in uh, international or internal comms and internal uh, culture. So this is going to be a really, really cool presentation. Uh, telling that story and joining us now is going to be uh, JL again, and with him is going to be Unleash CEO Egil Ostus. And they'll be joining us now. Hey, guys. Hey, JL. Hi. Hey. Good to see you. Hey. And guys, so real quick, our agenda was going to be a dialogue between Egil and JL. Afterwards, we're going to open up for a Q&A session. Again, if you have a question or a comment, just write it in your platform of choice. If we don't get it to it today, we're going to try to get to it after today's presentation. Stay as long as you like, and we'll get to as many questions as you can. Uh, that's it for me. I'm going to step backstage. Guys, have a fun conversation, and I'll see you in a bit. Thank Thanks. you, Jared. Welcome, JL. I'm so happy to have you here. And you know, Docker is one of my favorite software developer or companies for software developers. Um, I really recognize your obsession about developer mindset. Um, it, it stands out to me quite clear uh, how well that is expressed externally. And through learning yourself and also learning more about the journey we're about to, to listen more to, it's also clear this is very much internal. So we are going to go through and you're going to share some of your learnings. This is going to be hopefully very transparent, also not the fun parts, but also kind of the learning points, the challenges, you know, uh, change and, and building and, and fantastic organization is ju not just uh, wins, it's also kind of struggles along the way. So I'm, I'm quite eager to, to listen more to that. So let's go back to, I think this started around 2018, 2019. Uh, where, why, why was this sort of on the agenda and, and what was the situation back then? So thanks, Egil, for having me today, right? It's always interesting to discuss uh, team topologies and team structure, especially in the tech field. I think most of the time people are like super excited about their latest framework or the latest version of software in technology. And I think it's really good that uh, Unleash take the time to really talk about those topics. I think like uh, you can succeed in engineering because you actually talk about technology, but also the way we use the technology, which is communication oh, and team structure goes from there. And I, this is also why I'm here. It's like, uh, I, I don't I don't own uh, or like uh, the, the the truth about those things. Uh, so I think it, it's really interesting to communicate with others and exchange ideas, so we can all be better on those things because it's really hard, right? So uh, I wanted to start by saying this. And uh, so I'm JL, I'm the VP of engineering at Docker. I started as an engineer seven years ago uh, in the company, and I'm on the VP of engineering. Actually, uh, Docker went through a restructuring in 2019, end of 2019. At that point, I was uh, uh, managing the European uh, engineering teams. And uh, during the restructuring, I, I went into like uh, being the VP of engineering, so managing like everybody uh, in engineering at the time. Uh, it was hard. Uh, the, the company was, uh, everybody believed the company was uh, on, the, on the verge of success. We were the best unicorn in the world, of course, um, and um, uh, pre-2019. Pre and then uh, we, we faced some difficulties in the market, and uh, we couldn't really find the, the, the right market fit. So we have to restructure the company. And at the time, we were looking into two different, we have two, two kind of goals, right? One of them like was what you were saying, which is like caring for the engineers and developers around the world, making sure that um, our technology is the right one. And at the same time, we're trying to make money out of uh, a, a control plane uh, on top of Kubernetes and, and Docker Swarm at the time. And that thing that didn't really work out as much as we wanted. So whenever we pivoted the company back, we decided to 
let go a part of it and then concentrate on one thing and we concentrate on the, the, the developer workflow and, and, and that's what we're trying to do now. And uh, we've been three years in that, uh, three years, almost four now, uh, in, into, uh, into this. And um, we've been pretty successful, successful uh, at least uh, up to today. I don't know what's, what's tomorrow coming, especially when it was like in certain time with economic downturn and everything, but uh, we're all in there now, right? So um, yeah, that's, that's the main thing. So you need to understand that in 2019, the uh, company was 350 something, we went down to 70. Uh, mm -hmm. We left a part of our market. Uh, we we concentrated on another. So the 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 mindset at the time was like, how can we be rebooting our culture and making sure that we concentrate on the right thing? Because we were just like immensely failing in a sense, right? Like you, of course, you wanted to start something new and making sure that uh, Docker is still living and everything. But uh, the the key part was, uh, I mean, the mindset at the time was like how to survive, right? How to be successful mm -hmm. while you reboot something. So yeah. we didn't really thought too much about um, uh, exactly how the team structure would match. We were more like, okay, what's the best way to make people work together and make sure that the software that we're providing to our customers actually still to working well. So, so that, that's an interesting one. So if I get to correct there, you were sort of saying, okay, we have this challenge at hand. There is sort of, you, you, you need to be successful in business, obviously. So you need to make money. Everybody gets that. And, and what you were saying is also, you needed to really focus on the business needs. So you start with the business needs, you start with the customers, you start with that, and then it's sort of how can we or organize to make that successful? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, but we, at the time we were more like, hey, how do we can structure to actually continue supporting the software we're providing to our users? Because uh, again, yeah. like when you are 350 companies and you go to about down to 70, for instance, stupid things like uh, documentation or tech writing, uh, you used to have 10 people, you got one. Uh, yeah. You used to have like uh, like a hundred engineers. You got like fifty. Like how how do you reorganize yourself and you make people actually believe in what you're doing and making sure that you keep them in a sense. And of course, part of it was also being really uh, customer focused, right? And this is kind of the driving of what we looked into the team topology book at first. Is like, how can, I mean, Docker has inherently been always a tech company. Uh, it, it's always has been driven by engineers at the time. Um, and uh, it's still very much so. But what I mean is, uh, you, you know, there is this expression of like being a product engineer, uh, meaning mm -hmm. like you are an engineer, but you have a really understanding of like uh, what what how what you do is actually how do you productize it? What what, what, how, what how, how does it impact your the revenue, for instance? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this is the kind of a shift that we wanted to make. Also having like more product minded engineer, and the team topology book can really help you with this because it's really putting several teams into values, um, sorry, described four categories of team. And the most prominent one is really something which is business business oriented. Yeah, so so the the product uh, developer engineer there uh, is quite interesting. So tell me a bit about uh, the mind shift there. Was that a mind shift or was that already established? Or or where were you and, and, and how did you kind of get there? Well, that's really hard. Uh, I'm not sure we can categorize even today, like all the engineers that we have, oh, those one are there, those one are there, right? There is like, uh, and people are not in, in, in boxes, right? So they're more like more keen towards one one side of the things. I would say like uh, people who are, who are inherently technical are not necessarily uh, not product engineer, right? You have a tendency mm -hmm. to just look at technical things and because you don't want to see anything else, but actually that doesn't necessarily make you, that's, that's sorry, that's what makes you like more like a non-product uh, focused engineer. So I would say it's about culture, right? So one of the things that we said is like, um, since the company was rebooting, we were doing a lot of, uh, for instance, uh, uh, explanation around the SaaS metrics that drives the company. As a CEO, I'm sure you know this quite well, making sure that everybody in your engine, in your uh, in your teams, but in including engineering, really understand the SaaS metrics, right? That drives your company, right? Uh, churn. Mm -hmm. And uh, how, how do you drive uh, um, feature completions? How do the feature completions that you do, the releases that you do, how do they impact this? This is one way that you can connect whatever engineers are producing towards like the result that the company has. And I think that's that's something that we had to do. So I don't know. I, I think at some point I was could, coded a really quickly a, a, a Slack bot where you could ask the definition of any of the SaaS metrics and the, the bot was answering it. So to, just to gamify a little bit the thing to make sure that people really understand that. So I think it's like for every kind of change that you make, you need you need to take this into account. Like it's, it's going to be a long time in the mm -hmm. making. So you need to do a lot of different things to actually get there. 
yeah. So, so, so the SAS matrix, uh, on one, one thing is this very cool one to have this, the Slack bot there to kind of, uh, it sounds like a, a directory of, of, uh, of diff definitions, but, uh, how did you communicate apart from that? Because there is, is a week by week, is there a town hall? Is there, how, how do you kind of get through this to, to really buy, get your buy-in for the engineers? So one of the things at Gawker is it's like one of the pillars of our communication is like we have an open collaboration uh, virtue, which is something that really truly, which is not just like some slide that the CEO shows, right? It's really something that we believe in and that we really live through. And open collaboration means basically that you can ask any kind of question anywhere. And actually, like, uh, you know, when you have lots of Slack channel, usually you just like go to the least minimal of people. So you, you because you're going to ask a question, maybe you're going to be judged as not knowing, right? We're trying mm -hmm. to, we limited a lot the number of Slack, Slack channels, for example, at start, so people can actually ask questions in the open. So um, that's that's one way you you collaborate, right? So we have this open collaboration virtue. And then one thing that we do is that the exec staff, which I'm part of, is actually uh, producing those numbers every week. And we write it down into our, our meeting notes that um, the, the staff is meeting every week, um, at least every week. And then we produce like openly our reports to the rest of the company and everybody could look at this number at any time. And also we have town halls, uh, or like we call this all hands internally at Docker, uh, but where we kind of like run through some of the numbers when they have, when, when we have uh, like at the end of the quarter or the start of the new year or when we're starting a new, a new budget session or some stuff like this. We try to make people aware of where we are. I think like the best way that people can stay in a company is really understanding uh, how the company health is. And that's, that's, one, that's one way that, I mean, I don't want to have engineers that don't understand this, right? Like, uh, oh, how is the company doing, GL? I'm like, look at the number. You can figure this that by yourself. It's not that hard, right? You do way more complex things than that. Yeah. So, 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 uh, interesting. One of the the how do you invite for open questions? So, um, do you find that if you're limiting the number of of Slack channels where you allow or invite people, I would say, I, I guess it's more invite than allow. Uh, is the number of participants sort of a uh, a challenge, meaning oh, yeah. I will, I can perfectly well find people saying, okay, there is too many eyes on me when I'm raising my hand. So how do you kind of allow also those not so ultra-word type of people to, to raise their hand and ask their questions? So it's, it's, an, it's not a one-size-fits-all thing again, right? Like it's like something that you, you, you do a lot of time. So for example, when we started the company again, uh, we have uh, only 70 people in the company. So, for instance, I wasn't forcing the fact that we have a single engineering engineering channel. So people were doing the startup in there with threads. It was pretty noisy. Uh, now the company is back to like 300 or something. And then, uh, yeah, it doesn't scale, right? You can't. You need to have like more channels, or nobody can follow anything, right? Especially uh, Docker is really uh, spread among a lot of different time zones from West Coast to uh, Eastern Europe. So, uh, I mean, if someone asks a question in the start of his day in Eastern Europe, that people in the West Coast we'll never see it, right? So we, we're trying to enforce this. Uh, at the same time, we also accept the fact that there is like specific channel for topics. We actually click a closing channel whenever they're not used anymore so people can find their way. And now also we have a very popular channel which is named Silly Question. Uh, so you go in there and just ask a silly question because you already know uh, with humility that your question might be stupid. And actually it's that one of the most interesting channels because people can actually like, I don't know, ask anything that they have in their head without being judged or anyway. So that's, that's at least that's one way of doing it. So have, have, have you yourself uh, posted question in that silly question channel? Probably, I don't remember exactly what it could be, but like, yes, yes, so probably, yeah, I don't, you know, like another of the virtue of Docker is humility, right? And this is uh, because we went from uh, being a company that was meant to be ultra successful and we have a really strong downturn in 2019. So we wanted to have humility as a core part of our virtue. So uh, being humble is also knowing about yourself, right? Knowing your limit. Uh, and that's, that's one way you can actually, uh, we, we try to enforce this, or not enforce, sorry. We try to share this, uh, this virtue with everybody else in the company. So, hmm. so, so uh, T topologies is a, uh, a lot about value streams and, and it's a lot about understanding what you produce and, and limit the number of kind of uh, input for each individual team. So um, how, and and so my, my experience is often also that this is sort of, as you say, creating more a responsibility and, and focus for the product developers to understand the customer or the needs. But where does this end up for the product managers? Did you have kind of any challenges with the product management? Or where did they fit in in, in this uh, setup? So, 
Yeah, I, I mean, like, uh, so first of all, when we started again in 2019, we were very few of us and we didn't have a lot of PMs at the time, right? Product managers. So honestly, we are like any other company and I'm sure Gil, you're, you're facing the same challenges, like hiring product manager is super hard. Uh, so, uh, um, yes. and then, and then, yeah, it's super, super difficult. So we have a shortage of product manager for a long time. So I would say like our ideal structure was like, uh, to promote the fact that there is a PM for, for, for like five to seven engineers. But in reality, we have a shortage there. So I think like some teams were actually having a product manager that help even more like uh, drive the product mindset uh, that, that the engineers might have. Um, but in lots of, time, lots of teams, we didn't have product managers. So rather than having like, that, by the way, multiple, one product manager for multiple teams, we rather have like them like really on, on, a, on a single uh, single scope. And that's also one thing in the book. I think like what's really good in the book is like if you start one of the first chapter, they, they explain that um, individuals are not the key part. Like the team is the unit of work, right? And for the team to be the unit of work, you need to give the team some kind of autonomy. And this autonomy came with the fact that people have the right skills. Oh, it's not people, but like you have a, a skills represented by many, many per people uh, inside a given team so they can be autonomous and taking their own decision. Meaning that that's one of the reasons we wanted to have product managers inside the team, right? So, so they can take their own decision without having to refer to hierarchy or another member outside or a shared resource that would be actually limiting their bandwidth. So, so autonomy is a very interesting one. I, find, I think maybe one of those I particularly find challenging uh, quite often because you want to give autonomy. You want to have the team taking the decision themselves. But then again, you, you need to make sure that the team are taking this the, the, the decision that is kind of pushing everybody in the same direction. So how, where does the autonomy start and where, or where does it stop maybe? Uh, and, and where does sort of, I wouldn't say management, but leadership, uh, how does this fit in, in, in your, from your experience in, in this journey? So it, it's a very bold question. We could be spending an hour on that thing. And it's really a, that's really a fantastic question. Uh, I really like it because like whenever I talk about uh, autonomy, uh, engineers think about freedom, right? It was like, I can do anything I want. Well, yeah, but, right, there is an alignment. Oh, I mean, autonomy okay. is with alignment. And alignment needs to be uh, coming from leadership or at least like the conscious uh, uh, thought of everybody inside the company, right? So the way we do this at Docker is we have uh, the exec staff that's, uh, so we work with the OKR uh, framework, mm -hmm. right, to try to have objective and key result associated with it. So you have a, a sentence that describes the objective. And then you have a key result which is attached to this objective to, to actually see how you achieve it. For instance, I don't know, you need to make more sales into certain tiers of the market. And then you want to raise ARR by like 10% or 5% or 2 millions or something. Um, so uh, early in the quarter, um, I, um, the exec staff is like showing KR for the company or KR for the company. So we're sharing boldly with the company what we want to do. And then there is two things that goes in. So that's the alignment part, right? Like there is two things that goes in. The teams will then come up with their own OKR. So they will understand the company's one. And then, and then they, have, they have two things to decide what are the OKR. They, they know themselves. So they, have, they know that they have one PM, five engineers, like I don't know, front-end skills, back-end skills, whatever. And they also have a mission. And the mission is something that they've wrote themselves, right? So they, they come up with a mission and we this is where the alignment came right they, i say they come up with themselves they propose a mission and then we, we talked about it and then we discuss about it uh, and then we find a mission so every every team at docker has a mission an object a long long-standing mission uh that is that is written down and has been exchanged with others and then every quarter they they propose an okr that matched the the, the company one and uh this is the very difficult part because then then you have autonomy right you have a mission you have your objective. Your objective are something that you can share with others so others can understand what you do. Um, but the difficult part is defining the mission. And this is where the book also is helping a bit with like the boundaries between team. Honestly, this is the hardest thing ever. It's like trying to give people freedom and autonomy, but at the same time, you can't, every, everybody has the same freedom and autonomy or everybody's going to walk on each other's shoes and that, that's, that can't work. So honestly, this is the hard part. Uh, I don't think Docker did it better than anyone else. We had like uh, two two kind of issue, either two teams like having like uh, somewhat the same scope, right? Or at least the shared scope at some point. 
or you have like um, like we say in French holes in your in your racket, or I think in in English you say you have uh, um, falls things fall through the cracks, uh, which means that you have area where you do have you have no one, and uh, this boundary is the hardest stuff uh, to to manage, right? Because like mm. team also move a bit, right? Like along a quarter they discover new things, they understand more their customer. So they tend to be going into one direction and maybe it's the same direction that other team goes into. So you need to be intervening here and making sure that you don't have like multiple persons, of course, working on the same area. Yeah, so so organizing teams also makes me think about, and I think I also I heard him talking about this before, the Conway's Law. Yeah. So uh, how did you kind of use Conway's Law kind of part of organizing a team or where, where, how does these two teams fit together? In your experience, uh, or in in your experience in, in this journey, so at, uh, just after 2019, just after the the reorganization of the company, we, we have really something where we were shipping the org charts, as we say, so really following the Conway's law. So uh, basically, what does it mean for uh, for people who are listening to us is uh, the fact that basically you could look at the kind of product that the company is shipping, and you can. Uh, imagine uh, uh, infer from their 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 organiz internal organization. That's that's what basically the Conway Slow is doing. So at the time we were having like three products: a desktop product, a hub product, SaaS product, and uh, an open source engine uh, product. And guess what? We have like uh, three teams: <laughs> one which was desktop, and the one which is SaaS, and the one which is actually the engine. And actually, the issue with this is uh, is basically that uh, then people start thinking in silo. You don't talk to the others. And of course, uh, one of the stuff we are trying to do is like, uh, for example, one of the things that you can buy from Docker today is a subscription that gives you a, a desktop license, but also like a, a re remote uh, a process and storage uh, on Hub to store your image and, run, and then build them. Um, among other things, we're doing also scanning and a ton of stuff there. But like, basically, this is something that obviously is like making the two things work together, right? And this is where we hit the limit of the previous organization. We have like two teams. We have like different schedule of releases, uh, different way of working, different way of thinking. And they were optimizing for their own thing. So desktop were optimizing for the desktop way of working. And SaaS were optimizing for their way of working. And uh, for those who don't know, like, uh, uh, so Hub is a pure SaaS product, microservice, mostly Golang and Python, like usual stuff that you can see, I think, like in lots of different companies. Docker Desktop is a product which is uh, actually run inside uh, the laptop of every one of you, I guess, I hope. Um, and it's a very different tech stack, right? It's like uh, it's like uh, sometimes you have Swift stuff on Macs, we have C sharp code on Windows. It's really a different kind of engineering too, right? So even that was even reinforcing the silo between the two teams. They were not the same kind of engineers, and same they were not working necessarily with the same kind of language. So uh, this is where we were, and this is one of the when we started seeing that we have a lot of misalignment between those two, specifically those two teams. That we start thinking about like maybe we're doing the organization wrong, right? We're shipping the org charts, which limits our capability to actually ship new features. This is where we start looking into team topologies. That's that's that was the the the, the, the tipping point at which we started looking into that. So so I, I assume this is where you start to really fully implement the stream aligned teams yeah. more than anything. So so tell me a bit on 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 moving from this uh, this more kind of aligned around the products into to, to the value streams or stream alignments uh, on the teams. Well, what, what is, was that sort of a simple task where, because uh, was it sort of uh, microservices already easily fitting into those? There is a source code that uh, comes into place. So uh, share some of that kind of challenges moving from, from the one way of organizing to the other. So, um... One of the challenges, effectively, like the code, the code boundary is really difficult, right? Because you you used to have like a single team on one area uh, that was managing, for example, a GitHub repo, a simple GitHub repo, and then suddenly you have two teams contributing into this. So that changed everything, right? Like who who of you, the PR, or who who can make a merge into the main branch? Um, that's like uh, uh, so. At start, it was really I don't know uh, funky. I don't know how to say this properly. It was really a chaos, right? <clears throat> And uh, also one of the driver was that we felt that some teams were having too much of a cognitive load. So that's also one of the key driver for understanding the boundary between teams. We're thinking that some teams were always late, always on the back burner, always them on call, always them like doing like everything. And some other teams were more, more calm. 
So this is a signal that we use to actually define the fact that maybe this area where you have one team, maybe you need two teams, right? And actually, fast forward to today, one of the areas that we discovered in 2020 when we did the first team topology launch, um, we, I mean, I think one of the area of the team we split it in two, now it's split it in five, right? So the, the area on which we used to have one team is now we have like five teams working on the same, like fast forward to today. So that's, mm -hmm. that's one way that at least we were looking to that. Now, the code boundary is really, really hard because you have to change just everything, right? For instance, some of the teams were using a monorepo. So when you're having a monorepo, then you have a lot of shared, uh, I don't know, process and way of working, which is shared by, by like before two teams, now like five or six. So that's really something which is very really difficult. Like CI runs differently. People don't necessarily work in the same hours. So it's also very difficult, for example, when you're very far away from someone to get your PR reviewed. So I think like the, the code part is really the hardest because this is a, you can move people around. They can like after a month or two, they can be accustomed to the new team or something. Uh, even though, of course, like anyone else, nobody likes change. So you want to limit that as much as you can, but still, right? Code is another thing, right? Like who owns that di directory now in the monorepo now that we have like, uh, wh what's the shared part? So we, we try to be uh, very mindful about trying to map roughly our repo to the teams or the for, mm -hmm. for the monorepo, the folder inside the monorepo to teams. But uh, that doesn't work very well. It's really hard. So we have uh, we have uh, lost some not lost, but we have some area. At some point, we have uh, an issue. Like one process goes like uh, south on, on production, and you realize that uh, there is one team that is barely maintaining it. But uh, they weren't sure if it was their own responsibility to own that part of the code. So this is where you discover that you 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 have um, uh, stuff falling through the cracks. Mm. So so uh, are you also uh, how are we also working across time zones uh, on the value streams or are you trying to keep everybody in the same time zone for the ease of communication, I would say? Yeah, yeah, we try to do this. Uh, I, I am, uh, I, I was the, when we rebooted the company, I was the only one that the exec staff being in Europe, all the other were West Coast US. So I live this first end. I know how hard, how hard is it to actually have all your team members out, outside. Um, actually, when I started in 2015, I was uh, the only engineer in France and I didn't know a lot of Go at the time. Um, and uh, so I was really keen to have like feedback from my peers. So, and I remember I was, the first time I write my PR, I was anxiously waiting for feedback from my peers who were West Coast. And I was furiously looking at my laptop at like midnight the same day. My wife was like, what the hell are you doing with this new job? I was like, yeah, but I would like to see what my colleagues think about my work. So yes, of course, like long story short, uh, yes, you, we optimize for time zone. We basically have teams who are scattered around Europe, teams who are really US. And we have some teams where since now we have hired a lot of people in the East Coast of US, which is a very, very good time zone, at least for our setup, because you have like, they have their morning with European folks, they have their afternoon with West, people, West Coast people. Uh, so as, as a European, I don't have any, anyone to talk to almost like in the morning, right? So I have my morning free and my afternoon like full of communication. West Coast is the inverse. And then uh, the people in East Coast will, will tell you that it's not the best time zone ever because they can talk to anyone all day and then they never can actually do any kind of like meaningful work. No, I'm joking a bit, but uh, yes, this time zone thing is really difficult. Time zone yeah. is one thing, but culture is different, right? Like uh, you need to be, time right. zone is one thing, but culture also is different. It's not because you are in the same time zone that you can speak with the same people with the same language or not language, but I mean the same way of uh, understanding ourselves. So culture is also something which is a, uh, a difficulty when you're doing a remote team like this because uh, Docker is hiring a, a, almost anywhere in Europe. So uh, we're having a, a ton of different uh, cultures, ways of communicating and everything. So, so yeah, that's a super interesting one. We 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 can spend hours again talking about just culture, but just your two cents on. So, so from my point of view, you have sort of your company culture. This is Docker. This is who you are. This is who you want to be. But then you also have your team culture, and of course, everyone is also part of a nation. Or we have the heritage of U.S. or France or Norway. So, how how are you managing all of this? Because it sort of creates a very interesting dynamic, I would say. So, so to be honest, we have like 60% uh, of engineers are in Europe, 40% in US, and we have mass concentration into many countries, right? So we have a lot, lot of folks in US, of course. Uh, I think UK is a place where we have a lot of people, and then uh, maybe like 20 or so, and then same in France. 
And then after that, it goes into like a very small number, right? Like, so we got uh, folks in Portugal. We have a few people in Norway, but very, very few, maybe two. So I think like one thing to downtown, just like the complexity of it is like we have concentration of, of things, right? So um, um, the, 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 the way we try to have um, this communication going is by we openly co co collaborate within ourselves, right? And, and then this is like, it's kind of the same, right? As, uh, you ask an open question and you expect people to be answering with uh, humility and like kind of like uh, not treating you as a fool because you ask a question that you know about. Uh, that's one way. So like the open collaboration is really helping for people to be like kind of like trying to understand the other rather than like blast them right away because you don't understand that. That doesn't work all the time, right? Like there is people who get offended, but because the way you ask questions, language is a barrier too sometimes, right? As you can tell, I'm not speaking... <laughs> With very good English accent. So sometimes people don't understand myself. That's that's also a barrier. Um, but like on the culture part, I think one 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 thing we can I can tell you, which is like interesting, is like um, for instance, we used to have like a team where you have one French person and then five people working in UK. What happens the day where there is a French public holiday? Mm. Where the startup, it's everybody's excited about what we're doing and everything. So we've seen a tendency for people who are in this situation to not take their public holiday because their team were doing stuff, right? You were the only one not working that day. So you look a bit on Slack, you look on the email, you see like stuff are moving, oh, they're touching my PR, oh, they want to say this way. So people are actually, we're actually working on their public holiday, or at least partly, right? So one thing we did there to try to make everybody understand is like we, 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 we're, take, we're giving everybody one uh, day of, PTO of uh, holiday every month. And we align this to one of the uh, public holiday in one of the country. So for instance, like if you, so, so if the, the UK guys might have the same day as the French person, so the French person can actually take the holiday. Even though French people don't have to complain anymore because we have more holidays than anyone else. So that was maybe not the best example, but the point is in that case then, you make people feel better because they feel more as a team because they know that they have uh, other, the other holiday at the same time. And also you learn more about the culture of the others. Like, why do I have a, a holiday there? Because probably in your country, you probably are the only one in your family or your people around you to have a, a public holiday in a very weird day for the people around you. So it's, you, time, you, it's a way also to learn about the culture of the others. Of course, it doesn't work. Uh, in every case, because there is more public holiday than we can give to people, <laughs> or everybody will be in PTO all day. So, it, yes, it's like uh, just a way to enforce the cultural exchange there. That's uh, that's a beauty one. So, so where are you today? What is the status of your your journey today? So, you have gone through a multiple kind of shifts. Uh, I'm sure you're not done. Uh, this is never done. This is sort of an ongoing process. So, where what where do you see challenges today, and 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 how do you think about them? So I think like one of the key shift has been like, uh, so as, as we said at the start, we were focusing on a uh, um, team we were producing product, right? So we didn't want to have, you know, what, what the famous platform teams. So platform teams are a specific category of team, the team topology book, which is actually serving internal customer rather than external customer. At first, since we wanted to really enforce this like product mindset, we didn't want to have any of the platform teams because we thought we would have probably everybody in the, in the company wanted to do this. So we wanted to enforce this. So one of the key, the first thing we did, like I think like a, a year and a half ago was trying to start uh, uh, implementing platform team and see how they, we, they will behave internally. So for instance, uh, uh, serving your own customer is different than serving external customer. You have access to them at any time, but at the same time, you know them very well. So they, I don't know, the communications is different. Um, also, uh, there is a tendency with those platform teams to actually uh, do the stuff that they feel the others needs to be learning, doing, rather than really listening to them and doing the thing that they want. For example, uh, you have an engineer that thinks very highly of himself, listening to some of the teams, understanding their problem, going back into his cave, coming back two weeks later with a solution and telling them, hey, look at what I've done for you guys. And the other are like, yes, so what? And uh, actually he thought about something that was probably useful for the people, but actually nobody wanted because yeah, he hasn't listened to them, right? So getting the platform team to work was also like uh, quite hard, right? Like because we, we have all this whole product focus and everything. So I don't know, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was a difficult part, but I think it's a key part. 
uh, mm. platform teams then, um, are really here to make sure that the other teams can focus on their products. And uh, you also see a lot of common problems that some teams are facing. And uh, you probably want to have those problems fixed by uh, a single a single team there. So you have some kind of architecture unity, uh, mm. and then it, it just like uh, relieve the teams to actually think about this problem. Oh, they can count on these other team. They can hand over some of the work there, so you can concentrate on their on their on their on their work. So uh, fast forward to today. Uh, so we used to have no uh, platform teams. We used to have, we experiment with two. Now I think we have five or six. And uh, we concentrate them all into like a, a subgroup, so we can uh, work with them about making sure that they understand that this is a, a service, or, or they're supporting the other team rather than we really trying to push for things. So platform team at Docker are doing things like infrastructure, uh, like DevOps. Uh, some people are doing like uh, um, really platform by the definition of it, which is really um, providing tools and procedures for others to 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 start, for example, a new uh, a new service into uh, how, how do you start a new service on Docker Hub, for example? We codify this. Sometimes you have even like uh, some kind of a bootstrap code that helps you to uh, start new things. Uh, yeah. And then so another thing we did also fast forward of today is that uh, uh, we, we are we, we changed to a business unit model where we have like uh, we have so many teams now. So we used to have like 17 or 18. So we went to 22 teams or something into a site, like big monolithic thing. And having the right focus was very hard. So we kind of like uh, shifted the BUs, three BUs, three, three small BUs, which all of them have a specific area uh, of the business that they want to make. It's not a product, right? They still can contribute to the same product. All of them are contributing to desktop or hub or other products that we do. But that's also a big change there. Uh, from the team topology book, it doesn't change much, right? It's the same unit of work, always the same kind of category of team. It's just that they're slightly organized into subgroup where, with a communication uh, uh, communication chain, which is a bit, a bit facilitated by the number of teams, right? Mm. So today, we're mainly looking into new things. Uh, and uh, as we grow, um, and I'm talking to a lot of different people, you can see that sometimes, especially I'm, I'm very curious about the number of platform teams that some of the companies have. Uh, I think some 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 companies have very few. Some companies have, have uh, as much as a, a one for one. So one stream line team for one platform team. That sounds crazy to me, but uh, it's really interesting to see how you divide the work right there. So there is a wide variety of things to to experiment around this area, and we're looking mostly into this now to see uh, how many really platform teams, how much st stuff a team could be pushing to a platform team for for, for the team to be successful. Fantastic. I think that it's a very applicable conversation or, or challenge for, for a lot of uh, uh, companies out there and with, with software developers and uh, on their payroll. So unfortunately, we are running a bit out of time. I would love to continue exploring this topic, uh, but we promised our audience also to, to allow for some questions. So uh, Jared, I'm just uh, curious, are there any questions that is popping up on the screen? Let's see if Jared is uh, was still with us. There you are. Hey, hey Eric, I'm back. Yep. Uh, so we do have some questions from our audience today. So our first question looks like it's coming from Pranshu. Yeah. So uh, what did you prioritize as pillars to eventually decide the right thing to focus on for the organization during a worldwide pandemic? Wow. OK, big question. <laughs> um, so. Um, so part of the, one of the thing is uh, which is really hard at Docker is like Docker is such a, 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 a low level t uh, technology that you could do a lot of different things with it, right? So uh, it, it's it, that, but by the way, this is one of the things that drove the company into like uh, the difficulties that we have in 2019. We're focused on so many different things, so and we wanted to solve so many problems that at least at some point you lose focus on other things. So one of the key things that we do with 2019 is trying to focus on at least one area, which is like the engineers. But even that, it's a lot of things, right? You could do like uh, we've tried to build service, for example, for everybody, or, or or focus more on the on the on the on the scanning part of things, or like testing. I mean, there is a lot of varieties that Docker can help, right? And you see, like by the way, a lot of company doing things on those areas. Yeah. So uh, during the pandemic, the difficulty was mostly about like uh, starting new things. I think like everything which was actually running already was kind of like uh, uh, people were aligned on it and we were working on it. So I think that was like kind of working. What was really hard, I don't know for you guys, but that was like starting new things and getting alignment. Because then uh, 
usually put people in, everybody in the room, give them a whiteboard, and then they can jolt IDs and then find, find alignment very quickly. Uh, remotely, like you got one hour and a half uh, of overlap between like West Coast US and Europe, and then what you can do there, right? Like alignment was really, really hard to find. So I would say uh, trying to focus, uh, the, one way to drive focus was first, like understand that starting new things was harder, right? Mm. So uh, that's number one. And number two was um, probably uh, try to focus on what are the metrics that the, 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 the SaaS metrics that you want to move and try to see, okay, this, this quarter we focus on that one. What can we do about this, right? This is, this is kind of like uh, one way I would try to answer the question. Nice. And our next question is coming from, it looks like Kitan. And then what are the metrics that the team focused on and can you share them? So we have a lot of teams and every team is kind of like focused on, on slightly different things. So for example, uh, some of the teams wanted to drive the weekly active usage on Docker Desktop. For example, Docker Desktop is a product that you install, right? And then you use it sometimes, right? So how often do you interact with Docker Desktop, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Docker Desktop could be something that you can run your dependency on. For example, you're running your database and you forget about it and you use your IDE and you interact with it, right? That's the perfectly good usage. But then you don't, act, you don't use a lot Docker Desktop in that sense. You just run the thing, forget about it. Which is which is fine, right? So the one of the team, especially uh, working on the UI, was trying to drive the weekly active usage. So basically, uh, for some of the people who accept uh, uh, some metrics, uh, they are tracked on Docker Desktop, and you can look at uh, how often they interact with the with Docker Desktop. And they were trying to 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 make that more more appealing. And you do this by actually providing great feature for people to click on, right? So that's that's the main thing. And this is how we came up with like the small UI that you see now in Docker Desktop, when you can start, stop your container, start a container from scratch, all those things. One of the things where that's that's one example of a, of a metric that uh, the the team were focused on. There is lots of them. Usually, uh, all of the teams have like uh, one to three metrics per per quarter. Uh, some of them try to come with 10, we tell them it's too much, right? Like, it's like, don't show off, like two, one or three is enough. And, um, and uh, they change quite often and we have 22 teams over here. Here's, a, here's one example at least. Awesome. Uh, and the next question we have from, uh, looks like Daniel. Uh, in context of the new culture shift within startups, uh, at what point should a company abandon flat structure in lieu of a hierarchy? Wow, this is um, I don't think I got the truth on that one, right? So I'm going to just share what 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 is my point of view there. And this is like the Dunbar number. It's basically like uh, how many people. Dunbar number is like the number of interaction that you can have with certain number of people. You know, it's like exponentially. It's, I mean, it exponentially grow with the number of people you had in the team, right? And roughly around seven, it start to be unmanageable, un unmanageable by most people. Right, so some people are like really good, and they can do it to ten or twelve or something. I don't know. I don't know a lot of them to be honest. Some people like are fed up after three or four. So I would say like uh, the the flat structure to hierarchy, I think, is a very difficult thing because whenever you do this, hierarchy is always seen as something where you have like you get graduated or you get like promoted or something, right? So of course, when you go from flat to hierarchy, you not everybody can have a, a, a kind of perceived promotion there. Um, so I think it's a very hard thing. You can lose like key people because you're just like moving to that and they don't get promoted or something. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing we try to compensate this and a lot of technology companies are doing this, Docker is not special in any way there, but we have two track for engineering. We have a management track and we have an IC track mm -hmm. and we have correlation between the two, meaning like, uh, I don't know, a director level is principal engineer for instance, or, right, in the IC track. And we try to really have a program in place in internal to the company where people in the management track are here to serve a certain purpose, making the others uh, grow and making sure the candidate is there. But there is not much more uh, pride or money that goes into uh, someone in the management scale than in the IC scale. That's probably something that you need to be very taking care of whenever you do this flat thing to hierarchy kind of stuff. Yeah, thanks. And the next question we have, it's from Roman. Reorganizations can be disruptive and stressful. And how do you manage the human side of changing topologies? Yeah, it's super hard. Nobody wants change. Uh, you know what you have. You don't know what you're going to. So you know what you're going to lose, but you don't know what you're going to win by doing changes. Some people are also are, uh, the organization is going to move into a direction they like. Some others are going to be hate, hating it. 
So I think like um, I was trying to always be very explicit about the change that we're making and involving as much people as we want, uh, as we could uh, before doing any change. So it's kind of a slow adoptions of things, right? Like people understand how we're making the thing, like how do you make the cake, right? They, they kind of like be part of it, which is like then help them project themselves into it. That kind of work we were in 70. Now we're 300 or something. It doesn't work anymore. There's too many people. So uh, I don't know. Uh, making sure that uh, uh, managers and, and staff engineers are trained to understand that the change is coming and how to deal with it. I think it's a, it's a key part. Being very open about those changes, why are we doing it? Uh, what's the reason behind it? Uh, could we be avoiding it? And also trying to do as less as possible, right? Uh, you know, like, especially if you're an engineering team, that uh, the team works very well when they know each other uh, quite well. Uh, and every, every time you remove, you add someone to the team, it breaks this thing, right? So uh, being very cautious on that is the key point. By the way, on that, I'm very interested into looking into, uh, uh, I, I know like I, I was speaking with a friend who was working into a, another French company here, and he was telling me that why do we uh, not, we, we do promotion for, for ICs, right? We, we do promotion for every one of us. But what if we stop thinking about promoting like uh, teams, right? Like mm. what, what does it mean? Team, teams is no unit of work. So what is a team succeeding? Like why do individuals get promoted but not the team in itself? I don't know. I think it's a really interesting idea. I don't have the solution. I'm just throwing this in out because I'm thinking about this. That's why Excellent. And this is my own question, but like uh, how far ahead um, do you communicate the change before you start actually doing it? Oh, I don't. I don't have a. I don't have. A, so it depends. Like recently, we did a, a change to the BU, and we didn't give people a lot of room to think about it. So usually, we talk about it with management uh, uh, a week before, and then we do the change. Yeah. Um, but in the in the previous change that we made, uh, I think we we did really a slow thing. We went through a. I don't know. A month since we were involving people. I don't know. I don't think there, there, there is a single rule there. What you want to do when the organization gets bigger is like you can't you can't talk to everybody. So you want people to be talking about this change for yourself, right? So they're closer to the people. So I think it's like making those people aware before, so they can pass the words and and in their own way. I think is the is the key part. Yeah. Nice. And then we have another question, and it's from uh, Christoph. This is a big one. How do you think about technology for teams? You mentioned uh, C Sharp for desktop teams, for example. How are you thinking about splitting teams of technology, cross-functional teams, or teams of generalists, or something else? So, um, super hard, question, uh, super good question. A bit hard because I don't think again there is a single way of answering that one. Uh, the, the main thing is. Uh, we, we do not have a team of JavaScript and a team of people doing Golang, right? That, 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 I mean, at Docker, we try to avoid this as, as much as possible. There is one exception, I'm going to go up to it. What we try to do is having people who try to solve a problem end to end, right? So you have people collaborating with each other, solving a business problem. So you have people doing front end to people doing back end, eventually doing people doing like a, a Terraform or whatever is needed by the team, right? So the autonomy of the team means that you have a shared skill set inside a team to, to achieve that. So we don't have a C-sharp team and you don't have a, a Swift team, right? Um, so you try to have all the skills shared into the teams. Now, <laughs> that's hard sometimes, right? And there is also area of work which is like deeply specialized. For instance, in Docker Desktop, we have a team which is really um, looking into all the networks uh, uh, communication that happens between the VMs and the host. That, that's really a hard problem. So you need a kind of a specialist team there. And that's actually the book is describing this as one of the enabling, enabling team into the book. So you have a team of specialists, which are, with, with, they're the guy who know the stuff, right? And so it's really something which is really, really deeply technical. And sometimes in going to those teams who use a very specific language. But I would say, generally speaking, having a specialist in every team so the team can focus on the business problem and having like very overly specialized team on a very small area of work. I hope I answered. Nice. And then and I think we have a question from Daniel again. And this is, what's the talent growth process or what does it look like for Docker for an IC versus management? And how do you balance it within organizational needs and talent needs? So the first part of the question, I think I answered it before. I think we're trying to have a fair ladder 
uh, between uh, management and ICs. And we recognize the fact that in the company, each of them are as influential as the others. Uh, I think like it's like we recognize the fact that, for example, a principal engineer has the same prerogative as a, as a, as a, as a director. It's not because he's managing folks that he has more power inside the company, right? We want to have like ICs solving hard problems, especially in the tech company, uh, being as, as preeminent as, as we can. Uh, now, how do you balance this? Uh, this is difficult, right? Like one of the mistakes we made when we did some of the changes, we kind of like think about the, the, the skills of the people without thinking about their experience. That sounds weird, but like, for instance, you move, move the C-sharp guys into a team and the Swift guys into another one or like mixing them up. And at some point, we realized that we have all the experience folks into one team and all the less experience into another. So we basically completely forgot about the fact that you need also a, a, the mixing of experience into every team. So you have people leading and people running and then mentoring and all that jazz. So <coughs> I think looking at the experience as much as the as the as the, as the skill set, I think it's really really important. And uh, we learned it the hard way that we did like uh, we, we we did it wrong. And then. Um, yeah, then on the organizational basis also, we recognize the fact that, for instance, um, we used to have managers managing like uh, multiple teams, and now we're pairing them with an IC. For instance, like you have like five or six teams working together. And uh, we, so you used to have a single director managing like, I don't know, these people, that's like 20, 25 people. And then now we're pairing them with an IC, which means that as an IC, you could be at the same level as a director, kind of like helping 20, 25 engineers doing their work. And, it, and this this role is really new at Docker, so we we have a, a lot of varieties into the kind of people that do this kind of thing. Some people are like coding every day with the team. Some of them are more like architects kind of kind of person. But that's another way you can like balance stuff and then making sure that it's a reality that ICs and managers are the same level. Cool, nice, awesome. And, and guys, I think that's it for our questions today. And you know, for whatever reason we don't see a question and we didn't get to it today, we will answer it in the chat at some point. If you're watching this webinar. Uh, outside of the time this is streaming live, feel free to write a question in the comment. We will answer you. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, guys, uh, we are in fact on GitHub, on Leashes. Check us out if you haven't, just look up on Leash. Uh, if you already uh, know we're there and you love us like we do, we haven't given us a star yet, please do. Uh, make it look public. Uh, everyone here gets a swag store discount. Go to uh, bit.ly slash unleash dash swag and be put in the code Docker dash webinar. That's Docker dash webinar. You'll get uh, whatever t-shirt you want from the Swag Show, free from Unleash. Uh, we're going to be announcing our April webinar soon. Keep an eye on our social channels like LinkedIn and, and Twitter. Uh, it's going to be a pretty cool guest. And um, enjoy or just join the Unleash community if you haven't already. Uh, JL Agle, thanks for joining today. This is a really great webinar. I really enjoyed this and, and hope everybody else did. Um, and that's it for today. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you.